So we're going to turn back to Isaiah and to chapter 7. And we're going to continue our series of studies in this amazing and this pivotal book in uh, the whole of Scripture. And uh, it's not that I'm trying to start the run up to Christmas uh, nice and early by choosing a Christmassy passage, uh, but it is that we're just at chapter seven in Isaiah. And that means that it's a great opportunity for us to look at uh, Isaiah seven uh, and the prophecies of the virgin birth in, in a way that's separate from Christmas. It's, it's obviously about that. It's obviously about the coming of the Lord Jesus but it's good for us to step away from Christmas when we always focus in on the same things and to look at it uh, in isolation, if you like, or rather to look at it in its proper context. Uh, there is no question uh, that what Isaiah says in this passage relates uh, to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And we allow the Bible to interpret that for us. And you only have to turn to Matthew and chapter one and uh, Matthew uh, having uh, told us about the uh, the prophecy uh, to Joseph and to Mary about this remarkable event in Matthew chapter 1 verse 22. Uh, he says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so there we are. We have the Bible interpreting the Bible for us. So there is no question that that is what is going on here. But the point is this. Would we have ever made that connection but for Matthew telling us? Matthew is unambiguous. He's completely clear. But Isaiah himself seems far from clear. Uh, and I don't wish to cast aspersions on the prophet. There are reasons why that's the case. Isaiah's view is not 700 odd years into the future, but he's looking maybe three to 12 years in the future in his prophecy. And he uses words and terms which there's been an awful lot of argument about you you probably know about the whole debate about the word translated virgin here and people have sought to wriggle out of that in all kinds of ways could he have used a stronger word could he have been more clear that this is something that's going to happen in 730 years time and the reason we ask those questions is this prophecy is humongous it has huge implications isaiah is saying to ahaz God is going to come to us. Now, he's always with us. That's the truth. God is always with us. He's present in the world today. He is present with everybody today. There is not a corner of the world. There is not a dark place in the world anywhere, not a cave uh, deep beneath the ground, not, a, not deep beneath the sea. There is nowhere where God is not present. But of course, there are different ways in which God is present and God is present with his people in a remarkable, powerful, real way. And those of you that are Christians this evening listening to this, you will nod your heads and say, yes, that's true, that God is with me in a way that he is not with the world. But this is a huge prophecy. God has pulled himself away from Israel. Israel has teased it itself away from God. There's a, a separation and, uh, and Israel as a nation is torn to pieces and only little Judah and Jerusalem are left and here they are under threat right now. And God through the prophet Isaiah says to Ahaz, I will come to you. Savingly, powerfully, really, I will come to you. But the problem is then we read into the next chapter. We didn't read it, but I just want you to look at the beginning of uh, Isaiah chapter 8. We seem to have a fulfillment because Isaiah just said the virgin can have a child. They will call his name Emmanuel. And within three to 12 years, all the things that God has prophesied will happen. What happens? Well, Isaiah goes to his wife and they have a child and they don't call him Emmanuel. Now, that's not a great fulfillment of the prophecy. 
uh, Isaiah seems to be saying, my wife will have a child and we won't call him Emmanuel, but that's good enough. And so there are questions about this passage. So firstly, let's just uh, ask this question. Who is it a sign for? Who is it a sign for? What's happening at this particular moment is that Israel and Syria, they're described in different ways here in the passage. Ephraim is Israel uh, and Syria, Aram, and they've joined an alliance. They're really doing that to uh, gain security for one another against a superpower called Assyria. And they want uh, Ahaz, they want the, the little southern kingdom of, uh, uh, of Judah uh, to join that alliance. And if, the, if Israel, uh, sorry, if Judah won't join that alliance, then they're going to attack and put their own king into Jerusalem. Uh, and he will be a puppet king and he will join together with them against the mighty Assyria. And so we find King Ahaz of Judah at a critical point in his life. He needs to make a decision. Long time ago, long time ago, uh, there was a film called Ghostbusters, uh, entirely fictional film called Ghostbusters. But the motto was, who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? And that's the question for Ahaz right now. That's what this whole thing is about. God is saying to Ahaz, who are you going to call on now? You've got enemies lining up against you uh, from left, right and centre. What are you going to do? Are you going to join with Syria and Israel? Are you going to go into coalition with them? Or are you going to maybe appeal to the Assyrians, uh, which is something that Ahaz certainly is inclined to do, to go straight to the, the big boys at the top? Or are you going to trust the Lord? Are you going to trust the Lord? That's what this all comes down to right now. And we already have a good idea what Ahaz is going to do because he's out in a very specific place. Um, you see in verse three, he's at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderers or the fullers field. Now, this is probably somewhere around the uh, pool of Siloam uh, in uh, modern Jerusalem. And his point in being there is to, to see, have we got enough water? Can we protect the water supply? If, if, if Syria and Israel are going to invade, if Assyria are going to invade, you know, can we survive? Because water is crucial. And we'll find Hezekiah doing a similar thing uh, later on, but not out of a lack of faith, but out of faith. But Ahaz here uh, has a complete lack of faith. He has abandoned God. He's looking at the material, the physical things that are gonna, that are gonna help him in any conflict with a, a, a stronger power, a, a stronger army. And he's thinking, what can I do? His, his mind is turning over and over and over. How can I get out of this tricky situation? But he doesn't call for Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet who has access to the kings of Judah. It's normal in those days, a bit like, a bit like our Archbishop of Canterbury has access uh, to the Queen or in some cases to uh, the Prime Minister, though very little these days. But in those days, it was normal that the prophet would have access to the king and Isaiah is not called on. Ahaz doesn't say, uh, Isaiah, come, what, what does the Lord think about this? What should we do? What should we ask? And so the Lord sends Isaiah to the exact place, the, the precise place where Ahaz is, telling us he knows exactly where Ahaz is, just like he knows where every single one of us is this evening and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And the Lord causes his word to come to Ahaz. But it's interesting for, for Isaiah, it's take your son to work day. You don't get many of those in ancient Israel. But Isaiah is told to take his son with him. Verse three, go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub. Now, why does Isaiah get to take his son to work uh, to see the king today? Because his son has a name and the name means a remnant will return. 
So God graciously sends his word through the prophet Isaiah, who everybody knows is a true prophet. What he says is what's going to happen that when Isaiah speaks, God speaks. When God speaks, Isaiah speaks. And Isaiah is sent to Ahaz and told to take his boy who will stand there, this young lad, as a vivid, living, visual aid, a promise of God. Ahaz, it's going to be tricky, but a remnant will return. This is Ahab's choice. Align with Aram, align with Ephraim, align with Assyria, maybe look to Egypt. That was Hezekiah's mistake later on. And the challenge is this, Ahaz, who are you going to call? And it's a challenge to us, for us as Christians and as churches, in times of trouble, who do we ally ourselves with? You know, it's getting harder, this uh, COVID thing, isn't it? It's getting harder as many things are freeing up and yet other things are tightening down. It's getting harder as there's greater uncertainty in, in our land today. And we're all seeing the figures and we're all beginning to get edgy and nervous once again. That this uh, easing of lockdown, this gradual return to a normal kind of life by Christmas might not be happening in the way that we would want and the months have gone by and we haven't been able to meet and we haven't really been able to do any evangelism one or two things yes we haven't done any outreach we we can't hold any of our ministries activities we can't enjoy fellowship we can't even go to church and sing and the danger is this as we begin to wonder what God is doing we look for some strange bedfellows we look for people to ally ourselves with, to form alliances, to engage with, and maybe to work out the problem ourselves. We do it as individual Christians. We know that. We, we know what we want and we're not sure how we're going to get there. But, but we, we sort of do all the twists and turns and we, we scheme and, and we arrange things to suit ourselves, to suit the best outcome. And sometimes we form really dangerous alliances with those around us, those that don't love God, those that don't believe the word, those that don't love the Lord Jesus, people who endanger our faith. And we enter into alliances with people we ought not. Ahaz, though, is given an opportunity. What an opportunity. Look at it in verse 10. He's been told that the thing he's worried about, Syria and Israel attacking and overcoming Judah, that will not happen. Just the end of verse 7, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. We know what people say. We know what Aram says. We know what uh, Rezin and, and Pika say. We know what they say. But here's what the Lord says, verse 7, it will not take place. Oh, and that's pretty encouraging, isn't it? It will not happen. It's, it's doubly reinforced. And the Lord says, who are these people? They're, they're, they're nobodies. Think about it. Compared to me, who are these kings? Who are these leaders? They might be fierce in their anger, but they are under my little finger. And then the Lord does something uh, that I can't think of an equivalent of in the whole of the Bible. The Lord says in verse 10, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. What would you do if that opportunity were ever given you? I assure you it won't be. But this is a remarkable and truly unprecedented opportunity. What would you ask for? There are no limits on this. It can be as high as the heaven or as deep as the sea. What would you ask for? A sign to reinforce your faith in God. There are no limits on it. What does Ahaz do? He says, oh, he polishes his halo and he says, oh, I won't ask the Lord. I, I will not put the Lord, our God, 
to the test, this super spiritual reply from a godless man. Why did he do that? Why did he not take this opportunity to have his faith reinforced so that God would come to Israel? And the answer is he didn't want that. He didn't want to hear what Isaiah had to say. He didn't want to see a sign that would reinforce his faith. And you think, well, that's bizarre. If, if you had an unbeliever and you were talking to them and they were able to ask for any sign, you'd think, well, they would jump at that. Truth is, most of them would not. I remember talking to a man uh, who came to one of our Christmas services years ago, a man we've had uh, intermittent uh, contact with. Uh, over a really long period of time and, and we talked to, I talked to him about the things that we'd been talking about in the Christmas carol service and he said to me quite openly he he said well it's all very persuasive but I don't want it to be true and that's where most people are that, that's the reality I don't want it to be true I don't want to hear something that persuades me. I don't want to hear something that convinces me. I don't want to see evidence that means I have to believe because I don't want to believe and I don't want to live according to that belief. And it just shows the stubbornness, the hardness, the coldness of a man's or a woman's or a child's heart. And so Ahaz quotes the Bible, oh I won't test the Lord our God. It's against the law to do such a thing, even though God's prophet Isaiah had said, you can ask. In fact, you should ask. You must ask. And then things change. Isaiah in chapter, sorry, verse 13 says, Here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Forget the NIV's humans there. What on earth uh, are we talking about? It's the patience of men, the patience of, of people. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. So we're asking the question, you know, who is this for? Is it for Ahaz or is it for a future generation of believers is it for Israel as a whole and there's a little clue in what Isaiah says hopefully your version picks it up you might have a little letter or something uh, by the word you the Lord will give you a sign it might have a little note taking you to a footnote and pointing out something that our English language doesn't pick up very easily the word you is plural it's not you Ahaz you have foregone, forfeited your sign. You have rejected the overtures of God's grace. This now is a sign for Israel as a nation and for the future generations of all people. In fact, this is a sign for the whole world, and it's a sign for you and me today. One of the greatest signs, the greatest sign ever given to the world, a unique occurrence which is now part of our history, that is a virgin will bear a child and have a son and he will be called Emmanuel. And in 730-ish years time, Matthew says, that's what's going on here. Mary and Joseph, an unmarried, betrothed couple, faithful, godly, righteous and believing, were given the awesome burden of carrying in Mary's body the very Son of God. That's what Matthew says. That's what this prophecy was really about. It doesn't matter that Ahaz didn't get it. It doesn't matter that Judah didn't understand it. It doesn't matter even that Isaiah didn't really know what he was talking about because he's a man who is empowered by the Spirit to speak the words of God. And we're told in the New Testament, even they didn't understand the things that they said sometimes. Point is this. How are you going to deal with it? The miraculous 
birth of Jesus. You see, if you're going to deny that, then you just need to deny and reject the vast majority of the Bible because it's all the Old Testament is all geared up to that happening. And the New Testament is all built upon that event having taken place. The Son of God, Emmanuel, has come into our world. God is with us in a way that he's never been with us before. And by the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost, God is with his people, with his church in a way that Israel could never even imagine it's a remarkable thing what are you going to do with that piece of information a woman who never slept with a man gave birth the son that she gave birth to grew into the most remarkable human being he had a life full of miracles and unexplained happenings he spoke wonderful words words with power he healed the sick he raised the dead he died on a cross and rose and again all as was prophesied in the old testament and you can wriggle and squirm and say, well, I don't believe this and I don't believe that. But the fact is, you have to deny the whole of the Old Testament in order to escape this truth, that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the vast amount of biblical prophecy. Some of it's still to come. Some of it's not fulfilled yet. It will be in him. This is a problem for you. It's a problem for you that sane, reasonable men and women testified to it. They wrote of it. They gave their lives up for it because they couldn't deny what they saw, what they knew. And so the problem for us is if we ignore this sign, we will face the awful consequences that God then told Ahaz he would face. Because if you reject the unique virgin born son of god you reject god himself and if you reject god you reject his salvation his grace and his mercy and the problem is jesus christ is a fact of history in 2 peter 1 verse 19 peter talks about biblical prophecy and he says but we have the word of prophecy made more sure what does he mean by that he means we have a book full of fulfilled prophecies and promises and they're all yes and amen and fulfilled in the person of jesus christ secondly then because there is a secondly when is it a sign for well this is why commentators really do tie themselves in knots and the truth is and i can speak from experience uh, having looked at this a number of times and spent uh, a good while on uh, Friday afternoon, I think it was uh, wading through loads of commentaries and came out much more confused than I'd started. Clearly, there are time markers here in Isaiah chapter seven and verse 16. It talks about the birth of this child and it says before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. The land of the two kings you dread will be waste. What's happening here? Well, there is something for Ahaz. Instead of a sign of his own choosing, it, uh, there is going to be a sign, a sign of God's sovereign power and truth. And Ahaz will witness not only the failure of uh, Syria and Israel to accomplish anything, but he will witness the destruction of Israel at the hands of Assyria. These things, it seems, could have been avoided. Uh, had Ahaz believed God, had he wanted to believe God. This is a warning from history. Ahaz is an historical fact. And the disaster that fell upon Israel at the hands of Assyria is a fact. We have a, a, um, a, a tablet, a clay tablet, uh, a record from Tiglath-Pileser, who's the king in those days of Assyria, uh, and uh, it's just appearing on your screen, hopefully. It precisely confirms uh, events regarding Ahaz that we read about in 2 Kings 16, verse 8. We just don't have time to go there today. Uh, and he and Israel were humiliated, and they fell into severe idolatry, and Israel was ruined, and for a while it was a wasteland, just like verses 18 to 25 tell us but here's the thing to note the prophecy of verse 16 
was precisely true. What Ahaz was afraid of, Syria and Israel, that came to nothing. It did not happen. It didn't take place just as the Lord had said. What a determined, stubborn, hard-hearted man Ahaz is and how he represents even our own selves at times, what the things that keep us from following and trusting Christ. He's looking around for all kinds of answers. He's looking around for all kinds of solutions to very real problems that he has. And when he's presented with a God who says, I will do anything for you, he says, I'd still rather go it alone. So what you're like, you might be listening to this, you might have stumbled across this, who knows, but actually in your heart, you don't want the Bible to be true, though it is crammed full of evidences to its truthfulness. You don't want Jesus to be the virgin born son of God, living that perfect, marvelous, miraculous life. You don't want him to be the one who was crucified on the cross and buried in the grave and risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. Because if it's true, then your whole life has to change. So, oh, well, I'd rather trust science. Well, science has never proved the Bible wrong. And although it has you know, done some remarkable things, it hasn't exactly solved the problems of the world. In fact, every now and again, we realize it just makes things worse. Or oh, you're worried that archaeology might prove the Bible wrong and somebody's going to stick a spade in the ground and, and they're going to dig up something and it's going to just blow the Bible to bits. Mm, no, afraid not. Everything that's been dug up out of the ground so far that speaks to the Bible affirms it. And you say, well, there's loads and loads of people around me that don't believe this stuff. Uh, I'd rather stick with them, the majority. They don't believe the Bible. And the truth is that over thousands of years of assault and attack, the Bible has come through unscathed. You'd rather believe the wisdom of men. Oh, you know, men will eventually sort everything out. We'll sort out the world's problems. Just look at how advanced we are. Look at how far we've come. Look at the education and the societal reforms that have taken place. Look at the world in which we live. You know, surely they're going uh, to resolve everything. And yet you and I, we look around the world. We, we listen to a single episode of the news. And what do we realize? The world is in an absolute mess. And we realize this, that what the Bible says is true. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Ahaz had forfeited his sign, his special sign, but God gave him a sign that was for them. Within a certain period of time, Israel and Syria would be not a problem. But he then said that Assyria would come. And that would be a major problem for Ahaz and for the kingdom of the whole kingdom of Israel and Judah. But it's also for a later time, because clearly that prophecy of a virgin uh, giving birth to a son and, uh, and this son being called or referred to as Emmanuel. Well, that happened, says Matthew, and we know it happened in history. Uh, and none of this is problematical. This is typical of Bible prophecy. It's a great uh, example, and I've pointed that out to you time and time again. What happens is we get a we get a prophecy, and often there's a local, and actually quite disappointing fulfilment of it straight away, within a reasonable period of time, and then generations later you have a major fulfilment. <coughs> that, excuse me. Somebody says this is what. The prophet was talking about and bible prophecy is like this old testament prophecy particularly it, it, it sets before us a picture and you can almost see it you can almost touch it yet in reality it is much much further away and the prophet spoke as they were moved by the spirit but even they didn't understand fully the things they were talking of that's first peter 1 verse 10 again no time to turn to that 1 peter 1 10 we saw that in Isaiah chapter 2, where he's talking about uh, the, the peace that, that God is going to bring. And, 
and we're all thinking it's about heaven and in fact it's not about heaven it's about the church jesus does the same thing when he talks about the destruction of jerusalem in matthew 24 he begins speaking about the destruction of jerusalem which takes place within 35 years or so but actually what he's really talking about is the end of the world you see these bible prophecies have this double fulfillment very often local immediate actually quite disappointing but they're really prophecies of something that's infinitely greater to come so lastly then just to conclude this and i know the time's gone on what is it a sign of for ahaz and for judah the sign was of god's faithfulness to his word both the promises to be their savior and their sovereign Lord, but also the promises to be their judge and to bring upon them the consequences of their sins. For Ahaz and for Judah, these things were signs that the people must trust in him. And what God promised Ahaz at the beginning as Isaiah began to speak to him was himself. Emmanuel, it means God with us. God says, I will come to you, Ahaz. I will come to you, Israel. I will come to you, Judah. And for Israel and Judah, God was offering his unprecedented, unparalleled presence among them, but they didn't want it. And so it's strange to us then that immediately in chapter 8, we have a fulfillment that's very 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 disappointing look at the verbal clues were given in eight uh eight chapter uh sorry in chapter eight verse three uh it says this then i went to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son this sounds like the thing except the prophetess isn't a virgin she's not an unmarried woman she does give birth to a son and the lord said name him what emmanuel no in, name him Maya Shalal Hash Baz, for before the boy knows how to say my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. And then just go down to verse eight. We're in the middle of a, a, a section, chapter eight, verse eight. Uh, it talks about... Um, the king of Assyria coming uh, with all his pomp, it'll overflow all the channels, run over all its banks and sweep into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. This is Emmanuel's land. Go to verse 10. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Clearly it's a fulfillment of a kind, but it's a disappointing fulfillment because Ahaz is a faithless, godless man. And Israel and Judah are faithless and godless people who are working out the consequences of their sins and forfeiting the blessing where God says, I'll come to you if you would come to me. We know that the prophecies of uh, Isaiah chapter 7 to Ahaz took place. We know that Israel and Syria failed. We know that Assyria came. We know that uh, Israel and Judah became a, a wasteland. Verses 18 to 25 talk about the devastating effects of the Assyrian campaign. I know that one of the verses... Um, uh, verse 21 and 22 seem to make it sound like it's a, a land full of milk and honey. That isn't the point. The point is this, this wonderful farming agricultural land of Israel has been so torn to shreds. The only thing left is the remnants of the flocks and we milk the cows and the sheep and we eat curds and we eat honey because that's all there is. These are not tokens of rich and royal food. They're tokens of desolation, not abundance. So just in this one chapter, this one moment, we have 
a godless, faithless, stubborn, unrepentant, unbelieving man who has a great opportunity for God to come to him and to pour out his blessings upon the people he represented as their king. And he loses it and forfeits it. And so do the people under his kingship. But you and I face the same choice. Who are we going to go to? Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to believe? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Because God has given us the greatest sign of all time. He has come to us. God with us. Emmanuel in Jesus. The Holy One from heaven came 2000 and whatever years ago. This one came through the, a virgin birth, through a, a miraculous birth. His parents didn't call him Emmanuel. They called him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. But he wasn't to be called Emmanuel. People would speak of him as God with us because he did what only God can do. He lived among us as one of us and yet pure and spotless and innocent. And he died a death of a perfect one and rose again on the third day and now lives and reigns forever for us, with us. He's a sign of God's mercy and judgment that Jesus who came will either be our savior or our judge. And we're in the same situation as Ahaz. You could ask God for whatever sign you wanted, but you won't get a greater sign than this. The virgin, will bear a child and give birth to a son and he'll be called Emmanuel, God with us. We accept it and we receive Christ and God comes to us and changes our lives and grants to us eternal hope and righteousness and holiness that all came from his son. Or we reject that and find ourselves rejected and face the consequences like Ahaz did, clearly laid out in the world, in the word. Ahaz suffered the material, physical spoiling of Israel, but we will suffer the spiritual spoiling of our lives and the eternal consequences of it. God wants to come to you. He will come to you if you accept and believe. See, as it was said earlier in the text, if you don't stand by faith, you won't stand at all. May the Lord bless us uh, with these things and uh, help us to understand them and imprint them deeply and, and vividly upon our minds and our hearts. These are critical moments in the life of Israel, but they're critical moments for you and me. Do we believe God and the one that he sent Jesus Christ. We're going to uh, worship God uh, together again. We're going uh, to sing uh, a, a song that we know very well. In Christ alone my hope is found. <laughs>
And so may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever.